you, my brother. We appreciate that. So let's let's get into it. Um, anybody can chime in uh, on any, any given uh, thing, anything that comes to your heart and your mind. We're gonna let God lead us in this conversation, and sometimes God is the, is the best author that, that works through our, us as a vessel. So if you feel something that's in your heart that's gonna add to it, by all means, this is a open discussion because we're all parents, and we all know that uh, as parents, we are our protectors. You right. know, but I, I just when I first talked to Brother Maurice. Um, and the subject is dealing with sex trafficking, but we want to talk about a father's perspective because both of us have uh, daughters. And the last thing any father that's, you know, a daddy's girl, you know what I'm saying, um, is any harm coming to our young lady when, we, when they leave the house or any harm coming to them, whether it be our mother or even our wives, what have you. But just in general, that idea that, um, particularly in the black community, um, the numbers are astronomical, where we lead by uh, missing women and girls and still not being found in reference to sex trafficking, kidnapping, and uh, the alert is not as prevalent as those of other communities. So, Brother Maurice, from your perspective, my brother, what do you see that we could do better as fathers? You know, it's not about beating up men about what they do and don't do. But what do you think we could do better? Because once upon a time, because, you know, we from a certain era, that when we get out of school, there was a parent or a mother uh, pretty much in every corner. Everybody was outside when school let out. So it was very rare that you would see anything crazy going on. And for the most part, I know when I grew up, uh, most of the fathers that were working, the moms are out everywhere, either they're walking a group of children home or at every corner that was waiting for their child to come and meet them, what have you, whether it be a school bus but there was a sense of community. We kind of lost that to some, a large degree since the uh, pandemic, uh, technology, and then the social cohesiveness. So where do you see how we could do better as men, as a community, as far as addressing more security when it comes to this type of issue? Well, the first thing is we have to be present. And I think the biggest issue in the African-American community is a lot of fathers are not there. Uh, I saw Charlie Kirk, uh, who's a, I think he's a young Republican upstart getting to a debate uh, with a Caucasian female and about the issue of African-American men not being present, which I didn't want to really agree with a lot of what he was saying. But the, at the end of the day, it's a reality. We're not there. So we need to be there. Um, we're living in a different society now. You know, you can't discipline like we did back in the day, folks. So. As a result, you've got a lot of children that are kind of all over the place. We're raising a generation of babies, kids. So kid, a parent will take their child to children's church on Sunday. And they won't come back till Tuesday, uh, which I guess I kind of get it. But you got to get your kid. Anyway, all all right. Right, here's, <laughs> here's the reality. Um, you've got to be present. And if you are in a situation where you're not with the mom, be, with your, be in your kids' lives. Don't just take off and say, I don't care. Creating lives and not being responsible. Be in your child's life. Talk to them, teach them, guide them. That's your responsibility. You don't get to run away from that. You don't get to say, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. You don't get to do that. So you get you've got to be all in with your children. And you've got to constantly communicate. And and you know, my kids. We'll tell you, you know, my dad lectures and all of that stuff. And, you know, but you know what? They paid off. You know, my my children are adults now uh, and they'll be the first one to tell you. I appreciate a lot of what my dad said to me, taught me, my mom and dad both. You know, a uh, lot of conversations, a lot of talking, you know, a lot of counsel, being interactive. You know, you've got to be interactive with your children. Uh, and they're not always going to like it. They're certainly not going to like it, actually, <laughs> especially if you're long winded like me. But it's beneficial because you're saying the right stuff and they know you're saying the right stuff. As they get older, they realize, yeah, you know, you need to know how to talk to people respectively, respectively, yeah. uh, respect fully. I mean, to say you need to be able to listen to people, even when you don't want to listen to authority. That. You still got to do it. You know, if you want to get along in life, you have to be willing to listen to people. There's so many check uh, boxes that I could check in, in regard to 
what we need to be telling our children. Yes, sir. But there's we've got to be willing to talk with them uh, and be in their lives. It's critical. Yes, sir. But I want to tell us something what you just said, brother. And, um, you know, it, it, this is the beauty of technology. But once again, I'm a firm believer. And this is not anything towards your state, because like I said, you know, you you have the right to feel how you feel. But something that I looked up and I quote went to this about the absentee of black men and black fathers, because, you know, I have no problem when we're in the wrong, we're in the wrong, you know. Right. But in the same token, according to the CDC, right, it says that black fathers are more involved in their children's lives than any other racial group. The study found that 70% of black fathers who live with their children are more likely to be involved in uh, caregiving activities uh, than other counterparts of other ethnicities. So that report doesn't normally always go out, you know, and sometimes I take it upon myself to when I'm out in the community just to see um, children interacting with their fathers. Now, with marriage, that's a whole different ball game because, you know, marriage, that's, that's, that's work. You know, um, every ethnicity has their challenges with work. It just so happens that our community always makes the makes the lift for some reason to be the the example, you know, of dysfunction. Right. Unfortunately, I think they do that by design to show that our community uh, doesn't uh, can't function without it. But they don't have the same history that we have in reference to the breakup of the family. So I think that. Um, we have to give a fair shake and a, you know, and, and a kudos to the fathers and the men who do, uh, as me and you have done all our lives. You know, the biggest challenges and the biggest reward is getting up and actually going to work. That's that's right. a, that's a man. Most men, I'm saying, no matter ethnicity, if you're lazy, you're lazy. I've been in the military, and I've seen some of the lazy of the lazy of, of every ethnicity. You got those are good at work ethics, but it all depends on your background and your upbringing of uh, who molds you. You follow what I'm saying? And if you look at um, society today, right, you know, and we're talking about protection of our, our women, our young girls, what have you, they will give you the perception that uh, we don't care. You know what I'm saying? And I, I think that's hard to see because sometimes I've actually seen some men actually get involved where there's a domestic di dispute. Uh, you know, if a man's putting hands on a female, I do, I have seen brothers you know, actually get involved. Um, and that, and that shows, that says a lot, but that don't get caught on camera. But I want to ask, uh, Sister Kimberly, her perspective to a brother Maurice says, what have you. And then you as a woman, do you come around men? Do you feel protected or in your own experience, did you feel that protection from your father as you was growing up? How important is that is for you to have that? Wow, this is kind of a, it's a great subject, um, and it's a heavy subject. There's so many pieces to it, though. Um, I would say for myself coming up, as far as my father's concerned, no, the answer is no. As far as me feeling protected, I really didn't. Um, although, um, being around him, he's no longer with us. Uh, and it's been some years now, although being around him, I had, I had fun with him. He wasn't so much in the household. He traveled a lot. He was a musician. So he was with the band. Music was his love. It was his love, love music. Um, but as far as feeling protected, the answer is no to that. And, um, so I do understand how important I wish I did. I wish I had that, but I didn't. And I think from that, um, I can look back now and see maybe some of the decisions that I have made um, in my life, if it's in relationships or um, or not, um, that might have played a role in it, um, certain insecurities and things like that. And it was a struggle to really build myself up. Um, to understand and know my own worth. And I'm very thankful today is a whole different ball game, but it came from just seeking counsel and help and want to, there was a part of me, I knew that it was, I felt like there was a whole different person within myself 
um, and um, that wanted to come out, but I just didn't have the tools or know how to cultivate it. I guess I can use that word. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, hearing the, the minister coming into the nation, um, that was a whole different ball game. It changed my life. It saved my life. And um, I'm very, very grateful because I did pray for tools or pray for a new life or a better life. And um, Islam gave it to me. So regardless of what goes on in the world, I have those tools that actually has helped me to stay grounded or to kind of pull me back because this world is rough and it will actually pull you. And you got to be just as strong to pull yourself back and be more determined. I'm not going to live that life again. I want to live a better life. And you have to be just as strong. I'm saying just as strong, not, you know, that equal. You got to be just as strong to pull yourself back and be more determined. I'm not going to live this life again. And you see what's going on in the world. I don't want to be a part of it. So um, it's major. It is. It's very, very important for um, the father to be in the child's life, male or female, but speaking as far as female life, oh yeah, because her image of a man is like, however, and I, I didn't understand that at first, and I'm okay to even speak about that um, because I was, I didn't understand how real that is, how she looks at her father, and if he's a certain way based on how he is, she's going to kind of like deal with men like that, you know, and, uh, and sometimes it's not all that good. And you're wondering why, you know, we might choose the men that we choose. It's because of sometimes how the father is, you know, um, my dad wasn't all bad or anything like that. I'm not going to say that um, because he was he was that person, I will say that. Um, if I needed someone to talk to, I can talk to him without being judged. My mom is different. <laughs> She's kind of different there. I'll talk to her, but there's certain things I wouldn't talk to. My dad, I can talk to him about anything, you know, and um, and he would just, he would be honest about it, you know. So I do appreciate that part of him, you know, but um, it, 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 it is very, very important. You know, now, and as far as, and I know you didn't ask me this question, but if you don't mind, I will say sure. as far as a mother and I have all sons, I have no girls. And I know at one time, you know, the beginning stages of having children, I was like, you know, of course, well, most mothers, they want a daughter because I took ballet and, you know, you want to do those type of things with your girl and, you know, and well, God, he didn't bless me with a, a daughter. And now I kind of say, you know what, I'm kind of OK with that because it's rough out here when it comes to protecting your daughters, you know, your girls. And I know how I was and I wouldn't want to have to have gone through that but um, and go through that. But um, I was a little vulnerable, you know, more nurturing type of thing. And um, and sometimes I didn't know how to handle that. But like I say, it's a whole different ball game today. But my sons, they have sons. They have boys as well. And they are, I'm so proud of them because they are in their children's lives. They are right there with their sons. And I watch this, even my brother, my oldest son, which is 40, and I have a brother that is 40. They like three months apart. He has children and he's right there with his daughters. And one of his, or his son, his only son has cerebral palsy, like my youngest son. And he, he's right there with him too. Unfortunately, that the mother, they have been going through some stuff and the mother is not allowing him to see the children, which really hurt him. And I, and I see that, a, you know, we see that where it's like, here it is a father trying to be in the child's life. And then the mother is snatching the children away because of her own stuff. And it's like, so you have that dynamic as well. 
And it could be the other way around, you know. So sometimes it's not that the father don't want to be there. Sometimes it is the mother that's doing it because of her own personal stuff. And it's like, whatever y'all going through, that has nothing to do with the fact that he's a father and you should allow him to be there, you know. So and it hurt him dearly, but he's pretty much getting past that. And uh, I think they're working things out. They're working things out and um, it affects it, it. It has affect the children as well. So I'm well, very proud of you. Like, on the point yeah. you just made, because you made a very beautiful point and anyone can chime in on this. And there was so many key points that both, both of you have made. Uh, the first one is the protection, you know, naturally. Now we're going to talk about the positive men. Okay. We know we have those elements out there. Those who don't do right. We're not going to give them that platform, but we could talk about the men who are doing right. Mm-hmm. And to that instance you gave, whether uh, things don't work out between the mother and the father, which things like that do happen, but also this gen- this gender war that we're seeing uh, all over the place, where um, a toxic feminist movement has uh, increased. And this has nothing to do with not believing that women have their rights. Um, we cold believe that women do have rights and what have you, but we talk about where dividing the home and dividing the family. Uh, and this is just my personal belief. I believe that family is ordained by God and God didn't make a mistake when he said that when you put man and women together, you have a you know, civilization, you know, that wasn't a mistake, you know, but we're having this, this back and forth where, yes, every woman should have a right to live her dreams. Every woman should have the right to fulfill uh, uh, her capacity 100%. I agree with that, but when we have these these back and forth wars, even we look at the campaign that's going on today, and not to get into politics, but I'm just using it as an example, that you may have men who disagree with the vice president's policies, but now they tend to a gender thing where if you disagree with her policy, they're looking at it as you are attacking her, which is not you know not necessarily the the, the problem, but. Where I'm going with this is when you take away the man out of the home, the protector, and then certain things that men see that sometimes women don't see. Because sometimes, a lot of times, and Brother Maurice is a married man as well, when we go out, we're security-minded. We're looking at the exits at the door. If somebody's walking too close, you know, uh, looking at certain crowds. If a crowd doesn't look right, we're across the street. We look at different variables that some women don't see as, as men. So when you start separating your protection, or you vilify your protection, does that hurt the community as a whole? Anyone could take that question. Well, it it definitely hurts the community as a whole. I mean, it all starts with a family. I mean, societies, uh, communities, uh, functioning societies and communities are based on families being together. So, I mean, you you, you know, it's, you don't, you, you don't want to separate that. You don't want to, divide that if you don't have solid families and communities you're not going to have good communities and you're going to have an increase in crime and the murder rates go up and i mean that's proven uh, you know especially with boys who don't have a father in the home you know then they get into miscreant behavior slash uh murders and and theft and and all those different things so the, it's got to start with the family and you're right god did not make a mistake he, he said what he meant and he meant what he said Okay, we're going to start with a man and a woman and we're going to procreate and produce families and and on down the line from there. So this nonsense that 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 we are living in now in our society where, you know, oh, we can do what we want. We can do what we feel. Um, You know, it's it's very toxic and anti-God. And we we know that's the beginning of the deterioration and downfall of a society when these types of ideas creep into the mindset of that society and are uh, and are allowed to cultivate and grow. And it's just a matter of time if it's not curbed, if it's not interrupted and stopped, it's just a matter of time before that society ceases to exist. Yes, man. Yes, sir. So just on that part, brother, and uh I want to bring up what Sister Kim Marie had said also. You know, she talked about or spoke about how Islam 
helped her out with some of those disciplines. Well, you, you know, you you know, you believe in Islam, Christianity. A lot of foundations are pretty much the same because in the Quran and in the Bible, you know, we, we, there is the Torah and there are certain principles that are very similar. And it does speak about family, the union of man and woman, what have you, and submitting to one God. And one of the things that I've thought about when it came to the discussion about sex trafficking, we had a strong triangle growing up, right? We had the home where the family was. You had the school where the teachers took care of the children eight hours out of the day. Then you had the church where the community came together and prayed, no matter what your background was. You had visiting churches. Everybody worked in that nucleus. Now we don't have that as strong as we did before because um, the conversation always been after the PT, PTA meeting, hey, I'm going to see you at church Sunday. Yeah, I'm going to see you at church Sunday. Then you had those discussions. It was known that you got familiar with the teacher, teacher got familiar with your children, and the protection was there. So any predator had a harder time. That's saying those things didn't happen. But predators had a harder time because the community was tight. But once we start, as brother was saying, and you know, and uh, alluded to what Sister Kim, Kim Marie was talking about, once we start breaking those dynamics, right, where we have people fighting against beliefs, fighting against political parties, fighting because you know they're not getting along in the home, and then guess who, who's who's free among the world? The children. And once the children start doing what they want to do, and they're not knowing, and realizing the dangers, that's when the predators come. Where a van could pull up on a young lady. Walking the streets, nine, ten o'clock at night, you know, unaware of her surroundings, getting snatched up because she's on her phone, belligerent to what's going on, or there's no set curfews. You know, that was unheard of back in those days when I grew up. That if you walk in the street after nine o'clock, somebody asks you, How come you out so late? They'll ask those questions. Now you will see young children going to the store 10, 11 o'clock at night, you know, doing what God knows what because the foundation at home ain't there. So let's try to talk about solutions because we, we can always talk about the problems. But what can we do as far as those who have different belief systems, let's say, because we have Muslim and Christians on this program, what can we do to fix these foundations? Even those who may believe in certain politics, what solution do you think that we can come about in your heart and your mind that we can start gluing this foundation and start giving that protection? Because once again, as we speak right now, there's a young girl walking home and being preyed on. There's a young young child, young boy walking home because mom and dad got to work and he's by himself. So what can we start doing to throw those principles back in? Anybody can take that question. I would say um, oh, it's so much because, but I would just say this. I have a young lady and I know two, as a matter of fact, um, and I don't know if one of them is still doing it. She may not be doing it as much as she was at the beginning. She has a nonprofit. And um, one of them is called, uh, she has started it, I don't know how far she got, but it's called Melon Magic, you know, and the logo was so beautiful. And um, I met her because she has a, a, a son with special needs. However, um, and then it was another young lady years ago I met, she has something to do with teenage girls as well, a nonprofit. So that's just one thing that we can do. Um, and I told them both because I'm all about our young girls. I was a young lady at one, a young girl at one time. You're still you young, know, sister. And yes, still young. <laughs> you know, I'm a young girl. <laughs> you know, and well, I was 13 at one time, 10, you know, at that okay. age and wanted, we, but you know, the difference back then. Although I've had, when I spoke earlier about myself and my own insecurities and stuff, um, coming up, I had dance. My grandmother, my mother put us in dance class. You know, I was a ballet. I started taking ballet, tap and jazz and all that. I started off with ballet at the age of three, all the way up until like the age of 16. And then at age 16, you know, I kind of stopped fizzling out a little bit. But ballet is always... I'm always a ballet dancer. I'm always a ballerina, you know, but we were doing things like that and we would travel with the uh, dance company and we were in, we were cheerleaders, you know, um, 
and we were in competitions. And so we stayed active like that. Of course, it's a whole different time in double dutch tournaments, you know, things like that, you know, that was our activity. So we were in that a lot. Um, and we still got in trouble, honestly, you know, <laughs> but that still helped. It helped the life. We didn't have that. Oh my gosh. But today, those type of programs, along with um, what I was going to say about the, the two young ladies that I know with the nonprofit that have programs for young boys and young girls, you know, um, and in that they will have somewhere. The reason why she said she wanted to do that because she saw like her own daughter, um, you know, when they get out of school sometimes or they have nowhere to go. They just hang out at McDonald's or something like that. And when you just, you know how they say an idle mind is a workshop, y'all know the end <laughs> for the devil, right? And so when these children have nothing to do, you know, they're just open for trouble, you know. So, um, and and they want to go along to get along and all that. They want to get along and go along. And they'll go along just so that they can be a part of because they don't have a sense of self. But some of these programs would teach them and they will have value or see some value in, okay, you teach them about a little sewing, teach them about um, table setting. These are the things I was taught and I love it. From some of that, it actually helped me to go to culinary school. I end up coming out going to and working at the Hilton as far as a banquet service because I loved it. I was exposed to it, you know, table setting. You know how, you know, these are the things I was exposed to, which I end up loving. So to expose our daughters to how to take, you know, set your table, you know, they can have a little something in their own bedroom. They may not be in their house, but hey, set your own little table. How to be young ladies, how to dress. That's very, very important. And some may kind of pull, you know, they may rebel against it a little bit, but when you present it to them in such a way to say, hey, this is who you are and this is how you should carry yourself, you know, um, and then have a little dinner and let them know what it feels like to be served, so on and so forth. So that is just a piece of it. And I think you have to have quite a few programs out there because everybody, you got, you got DC, Maryland, Virginia, it has to be in these different areas, you know? So I think that at least, especially after school programs, things like that, um, that's a start. That's just a start. So you're saying having programs and different exposure will help out to help uh, give substance and also help with building community? Is that something that you think could be helpful towards uh, giving that shield and protection for our young girls and our young boys? I believe so. It's it's something that can help because it's a it's somewhere where they can go where they feel maybe I have someone that believe in me that I can talk to and I'm I'm in they're in something positive, you know, something that is maybe, you know, that can tap into who they are, where they may not be getting that talk, you know, or that type of energy at home. You know, and nothing against the parents because we don't know everyone's situation is different. Maybe some parents got to work a couple of jobs. I know my mother did. My mother worked a couple of jobs and I had to be home with the children and um, with her, my siblings. Let me say that. I didn't like it, but I had to be there. And I was upset behind that because I was like, but when I think about it, it was a blessing because I would have probably been in all kind of trouble if I didn't have to be home with my siblings while my mother worked a second job. And it was for, a, you know, it wasn't a long period of time, but it was kind of off and on. And my mother used to tell me no a lot coming up, you know, and I didn't understand. I thought she was the meanest mom ever. But I look back, I was like, that was such a blessing that she told me, no, I couldn't go to this club or no, I couldn't go to this party and I couldn't go out after a certain period of time, you know. Yeah, I, it was a blessing, you know, and sometimes parents may not, children may not understand it at the time, but yeah. Well, yeah. you said some key things. I want to get Maurice's perspective as well. Exposure. And um, one, of the, one of the things that we do expose is uh, we invite Satan into our home 
to the church, the mosque, all through the uh, the cell phones and technology, because mm-hmm. it, it 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 puts thoughts in your mind. Uh, it, it it gives you a gateway to be you know curious, mischievous, what have you. And you said it was a blessing that your mom kept you busy. So, brother Maurice, my question to you is, brother, exposure. Um, what what's a healthy way that we can help balance out exposure to something more positive that keep our, our young women, our young children, and the community more active? Because she's she brought up different activities, but of course we got sports programs and other things of that nature. But you know, let's let's talk about the church, for example, or the mosque. We could talk about both because it. Both of us have visited uh, both of them. Uh, I've been a part of both of them. And I, I believe that faith-based uh, organizations should play a large role into this key because, you know, um, they lost a little bit of steam themselves. And that was part of that dynamic. Just like you have a certain triangle, if one element's missing, you know, say we got to see and address, hey, what can we do to get all these functions going, whether it be the family, the church, or the school? So what do you think that we can do better as a faith-based organization as far as giving more positive exposure to our young people and actually galvanizing people in general to help protect our children from the predators out in the world, Brother Maurice? Well, I I think you and Sister Emily have both uh, alluded or mentioned some things that, you know, we can do to mitigate these problems. And I think... (laughs) You know, you you said something about uh, community. I know this is a church question, but, you know, at at the end of the day, communities, people don't talk. I mean, we don't know who our neighbors are. We don't we don't we don't want to know who they are. You know, we we don't invite people over and, 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 you know, hey, man, you know. Having a pie out and some coffee come over or, or take it next door with the pie. And whatever, just to, yeah, hey, I'm so and so glad you're in your neighborhood. All that type of stuff, all the pleasantries have ended. You know, when I was growing up, man, you you know everybody knew what was going on. I threw a snowball at a bus once, and my neighbor saw it, and she spanked me. Then she called my mom, and she spanked me. Yep. Then she told my dad. He called a bus driver and said that my son threw a snowball at your bus. You want to come over and spank his butt? <laughs> just kind of being a little facetious, but I'm just saying yep. everyone had you know, uh, uh, a say so in that young person's upbringing and everybody had each other's back. I, I got your kid, John, I saw your kid over here uh, or, or whatever. We communicate. I saw Sally doing this the other day. You may want to check into that, whatever. But, you know, we were we were eagle eyes back in the day on the children in the neighborhood, you know, and you better be back home before that light came on, that street light came on. You better be back in. You better be in the house. You can do whatever you wanted to do, but you better be in the house before that street light came on. So the the disciplines that were in place when we were growing up, they don't exist now. Right. And and now we put a cell phone in their hand for goodness sakes. So now we really got a problem. You know, it's it's the eye gate to evil. It could be the eye gate to light. But if you put something that powerful in an undisciplined child's hand. If there are no, you know, safeguards and securities set in place by that 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 household, then you have put that child in a very very dangerous situation where the the, the devil can come in and put all the kinds of things in their mind, and and all of a sudden you may lose your child. But um, I I just think it's it's more of a community oriented uh, thing idea that has to be regained and maybe the church can be you know or or a mosque can be helpful in restoring community because i tell you right now even churches are are not what they used to be mm-hmm. you know churches were all inclusive to neighborhood activities and and family and all those different things they were like the backup the teachers in schools were the backup to family and uh, it does it just doesn't exist anymore so I think churches definitely need to do a better job. Mosques need to be more inclusive as well with the communities and getting to know everyone, creating programs that can bring a community together. I don't know if it's, you know, cookouts or activities, picnics, barbecues, uh, fundraisers. I don't know. Being more inclusive with the community 
to protect the children uh, because, you know, we didn't like what our parents did to us when we were growing up. Some of us said, I'll never raise my children. I'll never do that to my kids. <laughs> you know, we all said stuff like that. But now we appreciate that, you know, experience that we had. You know, we're better people for that experience. Uh, but that, you know, we we don't raise. Here's another thing. We don't raise our children like we were raised. You know, right. we don't have that hard line. You know, this is what it is and this is what it's not going to be. We, we're we not as 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 uh, harsh, I guess, for lack of a better word, as our parents, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's mostly a bad thing because we we're allowing too much. Quite frankly and honestly, and I'm guilty. I'm, I'm I'm as guilty as anybody. I've allowed my children to do too many things, and they're good kids, thank God, because I I did what I could to make sure they understood the difference between right and wrong. But that I just think it's a breakdown of a society. It's just becoming watered down with more watered down with every generation, and it it, it produces more issues. And I think I want to believe the source of the issue is a national issue. Because we've we've become so liberal in our our ways of thinking, we we become so dependent on self. I can do what I want to do, you know. I I can you know call the shots. I don't need anybody to tell me what. I don't need the church to tell me what to do. I don't need my pastors to tell me what to do. I do I do what I feel is best for me. It's a it's a me oriented society. Uh, that we're living in. And when you do that, it becomes very dangerous because you've taken God out of the equation. You know, you're taking God out of the equation. And when you take God out, you get massive confusion. And that's where the society is moving to right now, unfortunately. Yes, sir. So beautifully said. And I think we all hit some strong points. And I'm glad that all of us are hitting some, some great perspectives. And we prayfully that um, those who are listening can see where we're going with this as far as because I know the conversations about sex trafficking. But sex trafficking has a lot to do with um creating that foundation, that armor. And the scripture talks about that we should all put on the armor of God. So if the community puts on the armor of God, no matter what you decide to call your God, because a lot of times we have taken the wind out of faith-based organizations. And sometimes I believe that it's disappointment because a lot of times people leave a satanic world and go into somewhere to get help. A mosque or a church, some people look at them as spiritual hospitals. And then when you go to that spiritual hospital and, you know, you need stitches, but they're giving you a Band-Aid. And, right. you know, they, they temporarily stop the bleeding, but you're like, yo, I'm still hurting. And the whether it be the minister, the imam, or the priests are not strongly dive into the book of actually what can help somebody, they can do more damage. And this is where people say, well, what's the point of me going to these organizations where uh, I'm, I'm dealing with the same element that I'm dealing with the street? And some people got to understand that wherever God is, Satan is there too. That's how you know that, you know, is this the natural of, of order of things, but the, 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 the power of God has to be bigger than Satan. And Satan is not some mystical little guy with a horn sitting next to you while you're at the pulpit. It's, it's, it's the choices that we have within ourselves, the God and the devil within ourselves. What do we choose to overcome those temptations? What do we do to see things in a bigger picture? And the reason I'm homing in on faith-based organizations is even with my experience, I'm gonna give a quick story to this. Uh, I remember us and a couple of brothers are out in the community and the brothers gave respect because they know we was Part of the nation, and you know, they, they stopped doing what they was doing, you know, because we was talking to the young children in the playground. They gave us that much respect that they stopped doing what they were doing, and we respected that because you know, we was doing giving out food and different things, what have you. And the brothers literally wait for us to leave, and you know, they went back to doing what they were doing. But there was a church on top, a huge church, beautiful church, and I saw some men outside. So I told the brothers, Hey, man, let's just talk to the brothers and see maybe we can work together with this church because they're only up at the, up the block. And this would be a perfect I, I, I don't, idea that if we work with the churches around this community, that maybe we can create that 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 um the armor that we all been talking about over the last 45 minutes on this, on this conversation. So when I went to the church, 
you know, one of the young brothers said, hey, the minister's not here, but the deacon's right over there. I said, all right, cool. So he was, he was an elder. So I went up to him, shook his hand, and, you know, I told him what we was doing and how we, uh, you know, what we was doing, how we put a curb just for that little bit of time and how, matter of fact, Brother Maurice and Sister Kimberly, when we were there, all the elders came outside. All the children from outside came to the apartment. So they saw a bunch of brothers there that were in good intent for protection. That's how I know it works because because we were there, they came outside. The elders went to the store. The children came outside in the playground. All because they seen that the, the, those, those who are causing the mischief in the community didn't want to get involved because of what the elements were there. God was present. So just to make a long story short, I went to the deacon. I talked to him about we what was doing, the outcome, and what have you, right? So I say, is it possible that you're maybe you can set a point for my minister, your minister to have a conversation and the men of the church, you know, we come together and actually come together and have a larger numbers because it's strength in numbers that we can go in and, and be more of a presence. So when we leave, y'all can come onto the uh, onto the forefront or we can do something in a larger magnitude. So a lot of you not, this bothered me like it happened to me, happened yesterday. I hand the gentleman my business card, you know, my name on it. And just because it had Islam on it, he handed the card right back to me. I said, what's wrong, sir? He said, you guys don't believe in Jesus. I said, what does that got to do with what we just finished talking about, right? And that one time, have you asked me anything about my faith? I believe you just thought it was a great idea a little while ago that what we were doing was helping the community. And I said, sir, uh, we believe in Jesus. And, you know, we, I understand, you know, we, what does that have to do with us working together to do better with the community? He said, my pastor or my minister would not want to talk to you because of who you are. I said, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. And I was so angry. I, I literally was angry because his narrow mindedness and his foolishness, you know, is a hindrance to what we just talked about. Where, all, if you just imagine all faith based organizations came together and we said, Hey, you know, you believe what you believe in, but the greater good outweighs, you know, our personal beliefs. And, and that's, that's the part that, um, that bothers me so much when I keep talking about faith based organizations that we're no different than gangs, you know, rivalries. And for what? You know, saying the common goal with the betterment of the community. And we told them, we showed them the results. Every time we went out as brothers, the results have always been good. There's an organization in Baltimore, Brother Maurice and Sister Marie, called We Are Us, where brothers of all faiths, whether you are spiritual, Jehovah Witness, Christian, Muslim, no matter what, they put those aside. They come together for one prayer, but guess what? Their power and they're growing. And those very elements that you're talking about, they have food drives, they have sport leagues, they have training programs, and everybody bringing their resources together for the betterment of the community. So that's why I, I, I was in this conversation that we talked about the family, the father, the, the belief of God, you know, the church, the school. When all those elements, like Brother Marie said, are out of the equation, Satan has free will to do whatever he wants. You know, and this is where I, I'm happy that you guys brought up all those key points because we are seeing free reign. It's not a reason why we should be all having this discussion. That, hey, there's a lot of our young girls being snatched up. Prostituting is real. We see it. We turn a blind eye to it. It's not my problem. Well, the, the way you yes, can sir. sum up what you just described, there's a story in the Bible where Jesus actually healed 10 men with leprosy. He told them to go to the pool of Siloam, go wash and go, go uh, thank the priest or tell the priest. Long story short, one of the 10 came back to thank Jesus personally. And Jesus said, where are the other nine? And the other nine were actually within the Jewish customs and beliefs and mores of Jesus. But this one man that came back, he was the foreigner. He didn't know anything about what Jesus believed in. The only thing he knew was he was thankful. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with the church. People are forgetting about humanity. 
If you believe in Jesus, do you know why Jesus came? He came to bring everybody together. So you can't be so heavenly bound that you're no earthly good. In other words, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like people are forgetting about community and fellowship and brotherhood and all those different things. Because if you really believe in Jesus, you don't miss these points. Getting back to your point, uh, Brother Vaughn, about the community. Is it about helping people or your religiosity? So great point. I, I, I totally understand what you mean. Sister Kim Marie? Um, I will say also, I want to say about the this tra sex trafficking um, in all reality. I, when I was seeing things, I was like, this is, I guess I could say I was like in denial. I was like, this cannot be real. You know, I'm like, this is not real. Because, you know, you see stuff on Facebook and people posting stuff up about people, children being missing and things like that. And um, and I, it just didn't seem real to me. I was like, this cannot be happening. But then I'm hearing more and more and more about it. So I was like, let me just tune in a little more about this because, you know, sometimes you may not realize or you might be in denial about something until something happened to you, something like that happened close to you. Then it's like, oh, now the reality, you know, of it is there. And I'm like, I don't want that to happen, you know. So I realized that this is this is real. You know, this is serious. And um, I think as far as what you both were talking about as far as community, religion, it's a bunch, it's a, it's division. You know, we got division among the religion. It's the time that we're in now would say that that was going to happen. But, you know, we have to be the light in the midst of all this darkness mm -hmm. because that's the time, that's just where we are. Just where we are. And I just strive to be the light. I know I can't, I have to realize I can't go out there and just save the world and just do everything. If I could, it will happen already. But it's just part of what's going on and how things are moving along. It's ordained. That's just how it is. But we have to be the light in the midst of the darkness. And being the light we could try and grab as many as possible. We do our best to, you know, grab a hold to these young male and females, even the adults, you know, because sometimes they need some, I well, you know sometimes, but, you know, we need some talking to as well, but so that they can better educate themselves. And open their mind too, you know, um, to even talk to the young people, you know. So um, it's just all of what we're talking about is just so right. But again, that's just what comes to my mind. We're in, it's a ball of confusion, and when you're in the midst of confusion, and it's just they don't know, and that's what Satan does do a whole lot. We got all these gadgets. We got the internet, we social media. We got all this stuff that just keep us busy to where we can't even keep quiet. Just the other day, it was just past weekend. I do a lot of quiet time and, you know, got into the Reiki and learning how to work with my own energy. That is wonderful. And that's something our children need to understand as well learning that type of stuff, you know, <laughs> because it's like, do you know how powerful you are, you know, tapping into your own power and energy? However, you know, I realized it was so quiet um, Saturday and Sunday. It was so quiet to where I just noticed it. I understand it and I appreciate it. And I was like, wow, it's so quiet. I mean, I don't hear children. And if I, I see the cars, but I don't hear the cars. It was just quiet. And and sometimes I just took that, that moment to just feel it. Sometimes, and I realized when you don't understand 
the importance of being quiet. You would take that and children and people would take it like I'm being I'm bored. I have nothing to do. I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with this quiet time. That's important to learn how to just be quiet. Learn that. That's that's major because every single day they on they just it, everything is just so busy. But I was able to sit back and just embrace that. And can you imagine some children feeling that feeling? That's like a it could be kind of eerie a little bit. But I understood and I embraced it. I took a moment and and was like, wow, look at, I just heard nature. I heard the birds and I just kept still. We don't know nothing about keeping still (laughs) and learning how to embrace quiet time. You know, things like that. That's important. That's very, very important because it ain't going to be loud and busy all the time. You got to know the importance of that, you know. So, I mean, it's so many little pieces that our children need to learn. And uh, that's why I say with certain programs, you can little by little drop these little seeds. You got to give it to them a little bit at a time. And you'd be surprised. I'm almost sure you'd be surprised how some of these children will gravitate to that. They're just not exposed to it. That's the spirit why I, I look at both of them, man, and they're so innocent. And then this yeah. world, I hate this world so much, man. No, the world, it's just it's just like, do we want better? And that's what makes me so angry so much, you know. And when I see yeah. uh, all these elements happening, then the music, man, it's like even back then we had Millie Jackson. But Millie Jackson and Red Fox, you couldn't hear it unless you went to your father's album collection and actually pulled it. You had to sneak it. You had to sneak it. Mom's Mabley, you know. Yeah. All, yeah. all that stuff. We used to go to the basement and and turn it down low. Oh, just to get it. If they hear you, you're like in trouble, mainly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I knew exactly where to find this, that stuff. They thought it was hidden, but I found it. <laughs> Isn't that something, Brother Maurice? <laughs> they, the parents thought it was hidden, but the children wind up finding it. And right. that's, the, that's the whole premise of when you invite Satan in the home, if the children always find it. And that's always find point. it. Get yeah. your prior. Yeah, my brothers oh, to be yeah. down there, crack Absolutely. it up, and we had yes. to, you know the needle. You had to put it down real soft because you put it too hard, you hit it because you know you didn't put the penny or the nickel on top of it. So you had yeah. to put you put you had to put that <laughs> real soft as it's spinning, and then you hit a little crackling sound on it because your father didn't That's clean right. it. You hit all the crackling sound on the record. That's right. And we was laughing so hard, we had to keep quiet because we was laughing. We didn't know what we were laughing at. It was just Richard Pryor saying some crazy stuff. Yeah, we, we made That's sure right. that 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 the adults were gone. That's yes, right. but we yeah. didn't. We didn't even. We didn't even take chances like that. We didn't play that game if they were in the crib. But when they were gone, oh yeah, that's when we took advantage of it. You know, mm-hmm. and we we did it all the time, like you said. But you had, like I said, I mean, it, you had to go and and find that stuff. I mean, the parents made an effort to hide it, but these mm-hmm. cell phones now, y'all. Oh my goodness it's all out. But it's the right. time we live in then. It's the time we live in then. Satan is on an all time high. Oh you yeah. Know. Well, oh yeah. Absolutely. So there's not even is there anything is there a PG movie out any lately in the family? Remember you used to have family movies, you go to the movies with your family and no, they were G movies. They don't make them yeah, they, were, like they, no. they don't really make G movies anymore. At all. At all. Hardly ever see it. Nope. They don't Remember make back in the stuff? day they had um Remember where you can go to the drive-in and we used to have my grandmother, my aunt and them had like a, what you call the, the, the wagon where you could lay the back down. We would go to the movies in our pajamas and watch, you know, it's the outdoor movie. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, that was like fun for us, you know, had our friends and then after the movie, we were already in our pajamas and we would go home and go to bed, you know? But um, you don't have that kind of stuff today. You know, it's dangerous if they did. Sister, let me just say this. We were not perfect, but we had it all right. We had good. Yeah. We had yeah. fun. You know it. We all had good upbringings growing up. It was wholesome. We weren't perfect, but it was all right. It was, it was a whole I, lot better. I, I literally shed a tear when I see episodes of The Cosby Show, how that 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 program was a masterpiece. 
Yeah, Cosby yeah, Shelton was a masterpiece because he he was so masterful of hitting topics with so with with class, taste, comedy, and you did not you did not leave his show at the end of the half hour without a strong message, no matter what it was. Exactly. It was a strong message, even when he was a genius and bringing in a different world. Because even when I was coming out, I was like, yo, it made you want to go to college. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And the, the the social issues were spoke about with taste. It wasn't graphic. Everything today now that we make is disgusting. I, I, I literally hate it because either it's over-sexual, you got men in dresses, person mm-hmm. is involved now. That was unheard of. Cursing's involved now. There's no more accomplished just to be popular. Yes, no, ma'am. So. so I just want to um, just respect the time. This was uh, definitely a beautiful topic. And I want to get some closing comments. And of course, we could have dove into the music industry. Uh, of course, you know, because right now, prostitution and strip culture is now today's entertainment. Uh, mm-hmm. It even made its way to political conventions. <laughs> Twerking has made it to the top of the convention where I was like, wow, 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 this is where we are. And the world's watching this. And the world is looking at how can you talk about a moral standards where everything you guys are doing is from the gutter. Yep. Everything is from the gutter. Whatever the gutter is, if it's popular, they promote it. And yep. the foundation, This that's Pretty much a lot what we talk about. The foundation has gotten to become has to become stronger. And I think in my heart that guys is is looking at this is not my door. This is y'all allowing these things. I gave you the assignment. I gave you the rules. I gave you the foundation. Nothing has changed. Once you start changing, like Brother Murray said earlier, once you start changing the dynamics of how God gave the perfect mathematics, man, no, it's God, man, woman children, civilization. That mathematical equation, you can't go wrong with. But once you start messing that up, we are looking at examples of the downfall of society. And it has nothing to do, you know, we have man's law, we have divine law. You know, and then every, matter of fact, you can look at the animal kingdom. They got more sense to stay Mm -hmm. in harmony to what works for them. The wolf pack didn't change up. The wolf pack didn't tell the chihuahuas, hey, you can roll with us and change of things. The bear is still going to be a bear. The polar bear is still going to be a polar bear. The lion is still going to be a lion for thousands of years because they have an order of operations. Mankind, even though we have free will, we like to experiment with things that we have no business experimenting, especially if we know it ain't going right. You know, it's like you're putting your hand on a hot stove. You keep getting burned. You keep putting your head back on the, on the furnace, then you get what you get for it. So I want to get some closing comments from uh, Brother Maurice and then, of course, with Sister Kim Marie, and I definitely appreciate you guys uh, being part of the program and prayerfully that what we uh, spoke about, the the foundation has to be getting stronger and how we can be better as a family, you know, is definitely important. So, Brother Maurice, you have the floor, brother, for your closing words. Well, I, I appreciate it, Vaughn. I, I think cell phones, is uh, you mentioned that earlier, you know, with cell phones in the hands of young people with no order in the home is a recipe for flat out disaster. And that's what's happening in large part to our society today. Technology for, you know, to, to be more specific is taking over the world and its mindset. There's nothing wrong with the technology, but it also gives the devil a great uh, opportunity to destroy the world as well if we don't make better decisions on how we use technology and how we govern our children and their exposure to it. Uh, and there's a great lack of it all all over the place. I mean, kids are don't even know how, how to have conversations face to face with each other because they're on the phone. I mean, they'll ask mom what's for dinner by text and they're in the same room. We're losing the art of conversation. Well, you're so right, brother. <laughs> yeah, right. We're, we're losing the art of conversation. And so we, we need, and it, it is really destroying our society. And we just need to make better decisions. Getting back to what you said before, uh, a moment or two ago, Vaughn, about just decision making. We got to make better decisions with all this good stuff that we have. 
all these great things that we have, we got to make better decisions about how we go about our business uh, at the end of the day. Yes, sir. Thank you, good brother. Sister Kimarita, the floor is yours, sister. Yeah, I agree with you, brother Maurice. And um, it's a lot of sifting, you know, it's a lot of sifting that we have to do because um, it's some good and bad, like say the cell phones, um, that's, is, hey, technology is what it is, it's, it's here. And I don't see it going anywhere, but it has to be controlled, monitored, I should say. Um, and you're right about the, you know, I've seen my family, my mother and my sister up here, and I just sat and watch and they're sitting right there and they, everybody on their phone. And I'm like, y'all came up here to sit in your phone. I thought that we was going to have a conversation. Hey, everybody's sitting right there in the, right there. And it's on the phone. We ain't talking to each other no more, you know, and I'm someone that I, I love to be engaged as far as conversation. And, you know, we don't have to be on that phone. Let, let's just talk and communicate. And it's taken that those type of skills away from our young people to even go out on interviews. And how do you. If you're not. Oh, you lost it. You'll be back. There you go. Oh, I'm, yeah. How to present yourself, how to talk. How do you go on an interview? I know coming up, my mother, she didn't like that slang. I didn't, she would not allow me to talk. If you talk it, you talk it out there. But when you come in this house, we are not talking that kind of language. <laughs> and that was just it. So I didn't. However, um, going back to, you know, we're in a world where there's a lot of confusion, but I just think that you know, the programs, it, it, that is very, very important. It's major, I believe, is very, is major because if they're not getting it at home, they should be able to get it somewhere else. You know, the church has failed to some degree, even the mosque or other places have failed to some degree. But, you know, these programs for the boys and the girls, certain things could be talked about. Um, and I just think that we should, we got to have more of that as well, you know, so it's a lot, it's a lot, but we got to start somewhere. Amen. I agree. Amen. Absolutely. Well, I just want to close out by saying thank you both. Uh, you gave some great insights and I can't wait to actually get this out to the air. And, uh, I believe that all the elements that we're talking about, if we can get those elements together, the school, the community, the family and community, you know, because as we're taught, marriage is the cornerstone of every community, you know, get better marriage. Because even uh, people talk about it's not worth getting married. Marriage is, just, is hard work. Isn't that easy? Um, but, you know, nothing that's worthwhile doesn't come with some type of uh, challenges. You know, you can, even with a nice car, you still got have some challenges. You still got to give maintenance to it. So no matter what you have, <laughs> you got to put some, even our mansion, no matter what you have, there's right. going to be some issues on the line where you're going to call for some help to make sure that whatever you are not, um, you're, you're not gifted at to fix, you'll find someone to come in to make sure you maintain what you're invested in. So you said right. that metaphorically, there are a lot of programs that she said that could come in and help fix our problems, but we have to be as a community and as Brother Maurice said earlier, that we don't get so caught up in our religion that we forgot we get brother and sisterhood, which right. is good for the community. You know, so if you're a Christian or a Muslim, Jehovah Witness, whatever you call yourself, look at the problem because Satan doesn't divide himself up. Satan said, Hey, I'm gonna do wicked stuff. I don't I don't have a title, I'm just gonna do what I do. We gotta have that same spirit. If we're gonna be soldiers for God, no matter what title you have. It shouldn't matter what a brother believes in. It should matter that, hey, my brother is on the same mission and we have to be soldiers as one. And uh, that's, that's what was in my heart to this topic. And I'm glad that our brother Maurice and Sister Kim Marie came into this because they definitely brought some strong tools. Because uh, no matter what the element is, if we have a strong foundation and we get back to those elements, um, strip culture can't, get into, can't break the armor that we have. Um, right. prostitute culture can't come into it drug culture can't come into it because those things have no power unless we give them to it right you see what i'm saying a person can't be an alcoholic unless you actually walk into a liquor store and actually put that bottle to your mouth 
has no power here. If it, right. if it, you know, it just sits on the shelf until somebody actually submits to it. So whatever we submit to, that's our God. So that's that's the closeout for me, me in this conversation. I uh, thank you all for what you have. Perhaps we have another conversation coming up. And once again, Brother Maurice is a clean comedian. You know, you have right. Sinbad, then you have Brother Maurice. You know, we got- I might need you, Brother Maurice. You know, I have my events and yeah. I'll be looking for some entertainment, you know, right. so. I have something coming up in October. Yeah. Okay. This okay. is a great program, Brother Maurice. And it is, uh, matter of fact, it's right up your alley. Because I, I heard you, the kind of comedy you do. And yeah. it's perfect for what she does. Okay. And being that we had this conversation, you have, you have some of an idea what it is. And it's part of networking. So when good people link up, um, good things happen. So by all means, I will forward you each other's information if it's okay with you. Yeah. And then yeah. y'all can yeah. work it out. Absolutely. And I want yeah. front row tickets at the first table. Uh, <laughs> if you perform. I want whole wheat rolls at my table and kosher butter. Okay, so I'm making my... <laughs> I'm making my order now. <laughs>